Praise be Jesus Christ, and welcome back to episode 28 of CarmelCast. We're wrapping up season four. We've been talking about the life of St. John the Cross and a little bit about his writings last time. Um, I'm back for our final episode. I'm Brother Pier Giorgio of Christ the King, Deacon Brother Pier Giorgio of Christ the King. I'm joined by Brother John Mary of Jesus Crucified and Brother Michael Joseph of St. Therese. So thank you again for for doing this, and uh, and thank you for editing all these videos. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't done it yet. (laughs) It's one of the dangers with recording ahead of time is uh, we don't know we don't know what in the world is going to be going on, and, and uh, especially during this time of uncertainty, we assure you of all of our prayers. Um, you know, whatever is going on at the point where we actually air these episodes, uh, know that we will be continuing to pray for all those who are watching. So thank you for watching. So as we've been uh, doing throughout this season, uh, I've chosen a saying of light and love that is uh, perfect for the digital age. <laughs> I think. Um, And this comes from uh, number 61 of the Sayings of Light and Love. See that you do not interfere in the affairs of others, nor even allow them to pass through your memory. For perhaps you will be unable to accomplish your own task. And, you know, what the, the great thing about the sayings of light and love is that we, we have no context for them whatsoever. <laughs> so we don't know what but exactly. There is, there is a context. Sure. <laughs> don't know it. <laughs> there is a context that we don't know. And, uh, but I think for our context in today's uh, day, days of, of um, just the digital age and uh, the, the great amount of transparency that people go about their lives and, and uh, observe other people's lives, the, the age of, uh, of reality t- television and, and uh, YouTube and all of these things. Um, just a great reminder for us to, to sometimes it's just better to mind your own business. <laughs> um, because of how much, you know, we can get worked up over, over things that we really have no control over and 20 years ago would not even have known about, mm-hmm. you know, in, in all likelihood. Yeah. So just a reminder uh, for us to, to that the ways in which these things can affect us and sort of corrupt our our memory in a sense and really sort of take over completely. So a good, a good uh, saying of light and love for the year 2020, mm-hmm. especially. Mm-hmm. So we're wrapping up uh, John's life in this final episode. And last time you guys did a great job talking about uh, John's, John's authorship and, and uh, the many facets of uh, a time in his life where he began to be um, busier with traveling and, and whatnot. Um, We'll start today with a big move for John. He moves from Granada to Segovia, um, and with that, it becomes even more responsibility. So, uh, what what happens during this time, and what's what what's going on? Yeah, John ends up moving to uh, Segovia because he's been elected to this uh, new position in the order. He's part of this group called the Consulta, and it's basically like uh, a body of of. Uh, friars who kind of are in charge of the entire order and they all live in this one house in, in uh, Segovia. Um, so in, I guess in, in like, like worldly terms, like this is the, the highest point in John's <laughs> life, right? He's, he's second in the entire order and uh, he has so many responsibilities. And of course, I imagine John doesn't see it so much that way. Um, I don't know how much he liked the administrative work that he got asked to do, but um, yeah, this was an important time uh, in, in, in that regard of leading the order. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it was, you know, a lot was happening too. So John could be part of a lot of these decisions that were being made. The order is still very young. So a lot of like how to apply things in new situations, new houses, all these different friars, maybe personnel problems that are starting. So he's very, yeah, he's just like really at the center of this kind of, I don't want to say crisis point, but, but crux of like, you know, the order's growth and expansion. I think Teresa of Avila might say this is a crisis point. <laughs> Yeah, uh, because I, if we were recalling back to one of our first episodes, we talked about the foundations of the friars and how just she was so happy with the foundation, mm-hmm. uh, the first foundation of friars. And then by this time, towards the end of her life, she has somewhat of a different opinion about <laughs> things because she th- sees things starting to go awry. I think. Yeah. So this time is marked by sort of uh, the emergence of two personalities within the order, um, within the, the internal sort of uh, consciousness of of being a Carmelite, uh, these these names are hold a lot of sort of context and and meaning behind them. But for many people, they've never heard of them. Mm. Um, we've mentioned once before uh, 
Padre uh, Gracian, who was uh, a confidant also of St. Teresa um, and worked very much in the early stages of the order. Um, but now there's this, and we'll talk a little bit about him as well, but now there's this newcom, newcomer uh, whose name is Nicholas Doria who comes from, uh, who comes from Italy. Yeah. And uh, through his influence very quickly raises um, to, so, uh, uh, to a position of significance and, and, uh, and well regarded by, by a good portion of the order. So maybe we can talk a little bit about these personalities and, and why they were opposed yeah. Uh, to each other, and and that'll kind of get us into the conversation of this this very uh, troubling time as Teresa would have understood it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like how you use the word personalities to describe them because I think that's really what's almost at the heart of this uh, the disagreement between the two of them is they have just very different personalities. Mm-hmm. Um, so Nicholas Doria was uh, a banker, um, and he was just very he seemed very like almost like kind of systematic and ordered, disciplined. Um, Whereas on the other end, Gratian was just very free, kind of mm-hmm. loving. Uh, he's more concerned with, with people and relationships rather than, than rules and guidelines. And so you just see, and we see this in our lives, right? Living in community um, or in, even in families when we have strong personality differences. We, we can be looking at the same objective reality, but we come at it from such different personalities that at times it causes tension. Mm. Um, and then we can either let that tension bear fruit and it can be, uh, a good thing because we have these different perspectives or it can lead to a serious crisis. Yeah, yeah and the hope would be that they'd complement each other, you know, and that was Holy Mother's hope. She saw Gratian, she knew his strengths and she also knew his weaknesses, but, but she knew with the right people that he would flourish and the order would flourish under him as, as leader. And he definitely had a more kind of missionary sort of point of view too in terms of what, what is the, the apostolate or the mission of the order. He saw a lot of evangelization, preaching, you know, um, definitely working with the nuns and whereas Doria you know saw more the the kind of internal part of just making sure you know we are, we're living authentically you know this this rule that we've been given this these constitutions that we've drawn up let's not go the way of so many other orders who have sort of lost track you know and and so and and two the need for kind of a life of contemplation so not doing too much maybe outside stuff so it's not endanger our kind of interior life um, so, it's, yeah, so very different perspectives in that sense, too. And so often when we have differences, um, we tend to see them as opposed to each other rather than perhaps complementary. Mm-hmm. And this is a big danger when it comes to, to dialogue, right? Uh, to, to not think so much in terms of either or, but in terms of how both, both sides can complement each other and bring out the best and maybe diminish some of the the less than ideal aspects of, yes. of each. Right. Yeah. And so that's what ends up happening here is uh, because it's interesting because Gratian's actually, he's uh, the provincial the, at, at the beginning. And then he actually recommends that Doria be the next provincial. So he sees, he thinks highly of Doria at this time. And of course, Teresa just, he, she likes both of them. Um, but once Doria is in this position of power, it seems like suddenly things have changed and, uh, there tends, there seems to be more tension, and Doria seems like a man who he doesn't like it when he's opposed, mm-hmm. and that is what leads to a lot of this conflict. Is um, if if he thinks that anyone's opposing him, then he will destroy them. <laughs> 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 and Gratian ends up being on the the, the end of that because uh, they don't always see eye to eye, and Doria does not like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Gratian suffered quite a lot towards the end of his life. We won't be able to get into that, um, but himself, uh, Gratian himself is a very interesting, interesting sort of uh, tragic figure in the history of the order. Um, maybe a, a, a something we can talk about in another in another season because it really is quite fascinating. Yeah, it really is. Um, so anyway, uh, we we see this this mounting tension between these two personalities and and. Uh, St. John the Cross finds his way into the middle of this. And maybe we yes. can talk about how, what happens to him and how he ends up in, in the position that he ends up in. Yeah, it seems like John is kind of just like walking the line. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's at times that he agrees with one rather than the other. And he seems, it, it's always hard to tell exactly where, where he is in all of this. Um, at the beginning, anyways, it seems like there are times that he disagrees with Doria. There are times he disagrees with Gratian. So... Um, but as we get further along, it becomes more apparent. Uh, John does not always see eye to eye with Doria. 
And yeah. that's, I think, when some of the trouble starts for him. Yeah, and you know, I think John, he was just so free. And, and I think that's the thing to keep in mind. Like he lived his way and he knew his way. Um, and he refused to be kind of boxed in by ideological sort of currents. And because Doria and Gratian kind of represented two sort of movements in the order and, and certain friars, you know, who kind of allied themselves with him. And, and John refused that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. he, was, he, he just, you know, seeking, pleasing God in all things, you know, trying to, to do what God's will in the moment and, and not get caught up in that stuff. So because of that freedom, though, he also did, yeah, oppose maybe certain popular uh, yeah. opinions in the moment. Yeah, one of our friars recently said to me, because even now we talk about, you know, you can have this Doria mentality or the Gratian mentality of, and it becomes this almost ideology. But one of our friars recently said, we don't need to have either of those mentalities. We need to have the John of the Cross, <laughs> the Teresa of Jesus mentality. Yeah. And their and, mentality was complete abandonment and trust in God. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's ultimately the Jesus Christ mentality. Right? Yeah. And that's what yeah. we need to have. But this yeah. is so much thing we need to hear now because our world has become so polarized and it's so easy just to, to be, yeah, you, you put yourself in a box almost by throwing yourself in completely with one side or another yeah. instead of being able to just be about loving God yeah. and, and let that guide you. Yes. Mm. So uh, at one point, John, um, Doria has a plan to, to sort of put John out of, out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. So what happens, what happens with that? Well, yeah, I mean, so in a very kind of an important moment, honestly, that John disagreed with the way that Doria was handling the Gratian situation and um, especially some of the kind of the penalties that he was trying to impose on Gratian. And, and John spoke up, and especially with Gratian's relationship to the nuns. That was one of the things, that he spent too much time with the nuns. He wasn't governing the order. And, and John said, if you're going to punish him for that, then punish me first, because uh, I spent a lot of time with, those, with the nuns. And, and that, uh, that got, drew the ire of Doria, again, like you said, who didn't like opposition. And so maybe that wasn't the only thing, but those certain key disagreements we don't maybe have the full picture of, uh, Doria decided... Um, that it'd probably be best for John to maybe be a missionary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting though, because I have read in some places like that John volunteered. Yes. Uh, John was like kind of, he was a, a little, I don't want to say disgruntled, but he was not pleased with the direction that he saw things going under Doria. And he was a little concerned. And he had kind of fallen out of favor and wasn't, wasn't given this position of authority within the order. So, and he saw this great need for, for missionaries. And so he volunteered, uh, or perhaps it was he volunteered once he was told by Doria that he was going, but uh, yeah. he, he volunteered to go as a missionary to Mexico. And it's an interesting, if, if that had carried through and, and he had gone to Mexico, it would have been fascinating to, to, to see what John would have done in the new world and what yes. connections that he would have. Yeah. We'd have so many more churches named after St. John of the Cross probably <laughs> in, our, in our country. <laughs> A lot more devotion to him here. Yes. You know, I get, I get these Google alerts um, if, on Carmelite themes and uh, you know, I, I, I have Google alert me when there's a, a uh, a blog or news on Therese of Lisieux or Teresa of Alva or Carmelites. Very rarely do I get anything on John of the Cross, and it's usually because someone has passed away and their funeral is being held at St. John of the Cross Catholic Church. <laughs> so all of you out there who are involved in Catholic media and blogging, uh, write more on John of the Cross so that we can, we can, uh, we can get him more in the popular, um, in the more popular um, mentality and, and uh, awareness in the, in the American Catholic Church. Definitely. I think yes. that would help a lot of things. Yeah, he'd be a patron <laughs> for all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, ultimately, uh, something, what, what happens that, that sort of prevents this, though? Yeah, well, because, you know, for one, though, he's seen, everyone sees what this is, you know, it, regardless of the circumstances, he's being totally marginalized. Here he is, the first friar, you know, the, the heart of the reform, of Teresa's reform, is now being totally marginalized, stripped of any kind of position of authority or supervision, or any, and, and is now kind of in charge of gathering some friars to go to Mexico to be missionaries. Um, and so, so just the, the hurt, you know, and John, John was hurt, you know, and he, we don't want to, like, you know, paint that in a different way. I mean, he was relieved, I'm sure, to not be in responsibility. But he, he knew what it stood for. He knew what, how other people saw it, too. And so um, we have some beautiful letters in that moment where he reassures people, it's okay, you know, that I'm in this position. God ordains everything. He, everything he does is perfect. 
and it all will be well, you know? Um, so he, he definitely takes that hurt and, and he, that recognition of the gravity of what just happened to him and, and translates it into trust yeah. that God's working this all to the good. Right. And, and to be a missionary in the new world would have, wouldn't have been, I mean, very, in all likelihood people would have been very disappointed because they probably would never see him again. Yeah. Um, but in the consciousness of, of a 16th century uh, devout Catholic, uh, going to the New World presented uh, a great number of possibilities yeah. in terms of in terms of spreading the gospel and, and having this um, evangelical spirit. Uh, yeah. I mean, the missions were were well sought after, and people people were happy to go. So I think in that sense, you know, the people around John would have been very disappointed, the nuns especially. But yeah. for the most part, I think um, to go to the New World as a missionary would have been a great a great uh, opportunity for yeah. evangelization. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so John, instead, he doesn't end up going to Mexico, but he's he's he moves to La Pañuela. Um, what's what's going on uh, with this move? Yeah, so this is in um, August of fifteen ninety one. So and John dies in December. So uh, or November. December. December. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing because in the old calendar, his feast right. day was at the end of November. Yes. But he, he yes, in fact, right. dies in the, in the middle of December. Right. Yeah. And um, so this is like very close to the end of his life. Of course, at this time, he doesn't know that this is the end of his life. He's, mm -hmm. not, he's only 49 years old. Um, fi yeah, 49 years old mm -hmm. at this time. So, um, but he goes to La Ponella, Pen Pen Penuela. Pinuela, mm. and uh, <laughs> this is is a place of solitude and quiet, really, for him. Um, he he almost just like plans to retire into this more hidden life of prayer, it seems. Mm. Um, but he ends up not being there for very long. No, and that's the providential thing in all this is that God knew, and, and he, he started getting these fevers and sickness crept in. There's a there's a great quote though where he he's writing about his time in La Penuela, and he says. Um, he says he's picking uh, uh, garbanzo. garbanzo beans, you know, and that's his job every day, you know, and what a change from what he was doing before. And he says, it is better to handle these uh, mute creatures than to be <laughs> mistreated, mishandled yeah. by living creatures, basically. So showing, you know, what he knew he was going through, but, but his deep appreciation for that time of silence. And he could work on some of his, he was working on the living flame still, actually doing some redaction on that. And... Um, and just having, he had the whole morning for prayer, you know, so it was really a beautiful moment for him. But then, but then the sickness yeah. kicks in, it's short lived. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the, the, the provincial Fray Antonio, the, the same Fray Antonio that we, we talk about occasionally, he's one of my favorite friars during this time. Uh, I love Fray Antonio, that's why I keep bringing him up. But uh, he, he decides to give John the choice whether um, to move to from La Ponuela to either Ubeda or, uh, or back to Beza, where he had been previously. Um, and uh, John's 21st century biographer has sort of an interesting um, theory about why John chose Ubeda over, over going back to Beza, where he had uh, lots of admirers and a connection with the, mm. the nuns in Beas, if you recall. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it seems like, um, I mean, it's often said that John chose to go to this town, Ubeda, where he was kind of unknown, a smaller town, for the sake, for that sake of just going to somewhere where he could be kind of, where he'd be left alone and not honored and things like that. Um, but it's also, uh, some of the more recent research has also shown that there was another uh, friar who was sick at the time too. And so one of them was going to go to Baeta and one of them was going to go to Ubeda. And so John almost chose this smaller, lesser place where he wasn't going to be treated as well for the sake of allowing the other friar to go to the, the place where he would receive better treatment or um, a more comfortable living situation. Yeah, more resources. Yeah. And, and poor and poor John, he, he uh, by going to Ubeda, he, he's uh, given to the mercy of the prior there who was not... Yeah. The nicest man or the biggest fan of of, uh, of holy father saint john yeah why do, tell us about francisco <laughs> chrysostomo uh, how do you say his last name chrysostomo, chrysostomo. i think um well <laughs> some years back you know sir you know sometimes forgiveness is a tricky thing and and <laughs> some years before um him and and his friend diego um francisco and diego were newly professed or maybe newly ordained friars and um, were very sought after as preachers, and so they were outside of the monastery, preaching a lot, doing missions, different things, and 
um, and John saw this as a danger, you know, that, that you end up messing up community life, you end up, you know, hurting your own sort of sense of your, your call if you're out of the monastery all the time. So he, he, he called them in and, and fraternally corrected both of them and kind of upbraided them in, in a loving way, of course, but, but it stung them, you know, because he said you're not to go out so much and preach. Um, and so that happened. Yeah, Francisco then was now the prior <laughs> where John, John comes and, and, you know, who knows the other things, but there was some rancor, the rancor there still. Yeah, yeah so Francisco basically, um, he, yeah, he wasn't terribly nice to John. Here's John, he's sick, uh, he's bedridden uh, with a terrible fever and these, uh, these uh, kind of infectious sores on his feet. Um, on his legs, and yet the the prior Francisco insists that John come to all the community acts. He has to come to the meals. He has to come to the prayer, and often jo John can't even get out of bed. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Fray Antonio comes and and, and intervenes, <laughs> uh, the hero, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, reprimands the prior again. So I can only imagine, you know, this guy, this poor guy, can't can't uh, cut a break in terms of getting in trouble. Um, <laughs> But, but uh, Antonio, you know, says take care of him and, and do everything that you need to do in order for him to be treated well and, and to get the care that he needs. Um, so we're coming very close to the end of, of John's life. Uh, let's maybe, maybe uh, bring that to, to com completion. What do we know about the last month or two of his yeah. life? It's interesting because he, I don't think he ever left the monastery in, in Ubuda. And yet he had this huge following. Mm -hmm. So like, it, it's incredible. It, it's miraculous that um, even though he ne yeah he never went out, he all these people had heard about him. His sanctity was known in the town, even though he never left. Um, and we actually have a lot of details about the last, especially the last couple weeks of his life. It's like down to the hour mm -hmm. almost. You have a lot of that documented. Um, but it's really beautiful to see in these last. Um, two months how he suffered um, and yet how uh, yeah he suffered with love and uh, he suffered remaining faithful yeah. to the end yeah and there's a great great kind of edification that he did by his patience you know it was the main like one of the main virtues that people brought out because you know just the medicine back then was very brutal in a sense and so he had these abscesses and they they had to cut from his his heel to his calf, you know, and to drain it and just how painful that was. And like you said, he couldn't walk. Um, and, and as it, the, it was seen as like a staph kind of infection that just, and cellulitis combination that just, they had no way of treating. And um, so as the pain grew, he would, they would hear him call out like more patience, uh, more love, more suffering, mm -hmm. you know? So he was always turning it into a prayer, the, 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 the constant pain that he was in, and then treating others very kindly that would come to see him and giving them good advice, you know, and, and uh, counseling them in different ways. And again, even though with Francisco, he started badly, but he himself came around the prior and, and eventually had a really beautiful moment with John. He knelt down and asked his forgiveness for the way he treated him. And it was a really beautiful reconciliation towards the end there. One of the funny stories I like at the end of this time is John's suffering a lot and um, they're trying to offer him just some kind of consolation. And so at one point they ask him if he'd like to hear some music and he says yes. And then the musicians come in and then John turns them away basically. So <laughs> it's like in this moment where he like, he says yes to the, the distraction and consolation, but then he realizes what he's doing. Not that he's saying that music is bad, but that he's saying, no, I just need to be in this and yeah. silent and just suffer through this yeah. and so he kind of has a change of mind and of course they you know they pay the musicians but then he sends, <laughs> sends them away without singing <laughs> it brings that brings new a new uh, sort of uh perspective to the phrase suffering in silence yes yes, <laughs> that we hear, yes. yes. and, and he, he knew his path you know i mean he knew what he was called to do and right and he just had to stick to it to the end you know not to say that other people wouldn't take Bro, right it, even for you know very good reasons but but um but then he, you know, it shows too that Marian, his deep Marian love and devotion that was from the very beginning that maybe he didn't write about a lot, but was so present in his life that um, on the, the, I believe is the vigil of the Immaculate Conception, he received some sort of premonition or, or gift revelation that when he would die and he knew the day, the hour, the moment yeah. that he would die. So from that point on, it was like, 
very uh, just imp not impatient necessarily in a bad way, but just he kept asking, "What day is it? Yes. What day is it?" Yeah, Kaora S. Kaora S. That's something he kept asking. He, he was because he knew he they'd ask, "Why are you asking?" And he says, "Well, I, I'm going to celebrate matins in heaven." And so that would be at midnight when the bells ring for matins. And so he was anxiously awaiting this, this moment when yeah. he could go and be with his beloved uh, for eternity. Yes. Yeah. And he was so happy to die on a Saturday. It was the 14th and it was, yeah, the midnight had passed. The bells had rung. He said, now I'm going to go pray matins with the Blessed Virgin Mary in heaven. Um, and, he, and, and he died. And his last words being, um, I believe, from Jesus on the cross into your hands. Yes, Lord, I, I commend my spirit. Yeah, and that was oh. December 14th of 1591. Yes, right. yes. So, so maybe to wrap up, we can maybe just share uh, one thing from each of us of, of something that just really strikes you. Um, what's something that John has taught you? What's something that uh, you value John for? What's something you would like people to know about John? Um, maybe that'd be a good place to end this, this season that we've dedicated to, to our Holy Father, St. John of the Cross. Yeah. I feel like really for me, John has been kind of with me from the beginning of my um, my time really uh, praying, being a man of prayer and like uh, reading spiritual writings. He was there at the beginning, not so much as even like a friend at the beginning, but uh, I can't imagine like living a life of prayer without his guidance. And uh, as I've grown and read him more and learned more about him, I've really started to fall more in love with his teaching and see just for me how central it is and how essential it is uh, for my own growth and holiness and, and, and living a life of prayer. Yeah, yeah I, think, um, I think John for me has always just been a con like getting me back on track. Like reading John or even his life, even doing for these episodes just helps me um, know like what my path is, you know, and, and he represents so much of like that it is possible to, to seek God alone. Like, and to make that really the defining mark of your whole life. And I remember at times in the past almost wondering if that's possible. And John's life just proves to me it is. And it's such a desirable thing. And it's, it's really the, the path to happiness, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's, yeah, he's just such a, a good reminder of that and always kind of gets me back on track. I'll take a different approach than, than both of you. But a, a misconception that people have about John that I think is unfair is, is that he's some sort of like harsh harsh saint or, or, or one who, who is very difficult to follow in his, in his path towards sanctity. Um, and perhaps part of that, some of that is due to, to um, you know, a, a long history of, of his writings being misunderstood in English. Um, but to, to remember that above all, John was, was a man who was deeply in love with Jesus Christ mm -hmm. um, and a man who was, who was so merciful to his brothers and so forgiving. Um, and just lived lived a life of of, of charity, um, in his desire to to love Jesus, uh, and so any of those misconceptions I think should be should be uh, challenged um, by reading, actually reading his writings, mm -hmm. and uh, I would recommend the the Kavanaugh Otilio Rodriguez uh, translation published by ICS, uh, but it's uh, it's it's you know we have that here we've been reading from that uh, throughout the season. And one great thing about uh, ICS upcoming is we have uh, a, an important translation approaching. I hope we can get it out before, before the 100th anniversary of his being made a doctor of the church, which mm. is, would be 2016, so I think we can manage that. 2026. So I think we can manage six years uh, to get that out, but uh, being translated now, uh, the definitive biography of his life and, and really all those great stories and, and anecdotes that we were sharing throughout throughout the season um, came from from the early drafts of that translation as well as Brother's own study of of uh, that biography in Spanish, uh, even though the English was available. So I, I, I commend you <laughs> in doing that. But anyway, we thank you so much for joining us for this season, and we look forward to uh, coming back in the spring. And uh, who knows what we'll, what we'll be doing then. And uh, if you have any ideas, as always, please let us know. And I think we'll probably share a survey um, we usually do at the end of the season just to give you to give you the opportunity to share your thoughts and and share your suggestions. So thank you and God bless you.
Hey everyone, Brother Pier Giorgio here. Thanks for checking out this episode of CarmelCast. If you want to hear more of us, don't forget to click subscribe. Also, be sure to click like if you enjoyed this episode, and maybe even leave us a comment. We post discussion questions down below to get the conversation going. Want more information on Carmelite spirituality and the Discalced Carmelite Saints? Then you'll want to check out our website, www.icspublications.org. There's a link in the description of this episode. From here, you can see all our current promotions and access our complete catalog for the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and St. Edith Stein. If you want to stay up to date on all our promotions and new titles, then be sure to add your email to our email list. There's no better way to stay up to date on the latest Carmelite publications. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless you.